My name is Mark Stevenson. I'm with the Highlands Ranch Historical Society here today at the East Ridge Rec Center in Highlands Ranch, Colorado. And we're about to have a conversation with somebody who has worked and been in the community here for a very long time at this point. Uh, tell us who you are and how to pronounce your last name. Uh, John Kilrow. Um, and I've been at Highlands Ranch for almost 41 years now. Hard to believe. And that's about Hard the same age as the community. Yes, it is. The community started in the late 70s or so. Yeah, 1979 was the zoning approval. Mm -hmm. Housing started in the early 80s. Yep. I was a construction superintendent on the first phase of Bayfield Homes. And that uh, was one of the three developments. If that I was remember, right? Bayfield, Stony Point, and Groves were the first yeah. three development. Do you remember the price points of those? I believe they were in the 70s. Um, I'm, but I don't really remember on Bayfield. Mm -hmm. Groves was a less expensive price point and Stony Point a little higher. Yep. Yeah. So how did you come to be working at uh, what was probably Mission Viejo at that time in 81? It was Mission Viejo Company. Um, mm -hmm. My my track was from Boston, New England area. I got a degree in construction and architecture. Where did you go to school? I went to school at Wentworth Institute College in Boston. And uh, I had the desire to ski. I had worked in the uh, yachting industry for a few years on the America's Cup boats. And I uh, wanted to be a ski bum. So when I got done, I met a couple guys that were coming out to going to Idaho and uh, jumped in the truck with them, hardly knew them, and uh, we ended up in Steamboat Springs because that's where we ran out of money. <laughs> and uh, I was fortunate enough to meet a man there who, who was still my mentor, who had a home building business and he wanted to grow it. And I was fortunate enough to grow it with him. And we ended up building a few hundred homes in Steamboat. And then eventually I got injured, couldn't work anymore with my tools, which you needed to do there. So I moved to Denver to get an office job. Um, and what year was that? That was in 79. And I found an office job as an estimator on high rise buildings downtown, which I had no idea what I was doing, but I figured it out. And, uh, but I really didn't like it. I missed home building. At the time, my wife and I we're driving down County Line Road and I saw him put a water line in and I told her how silly that must be because nothing was going to go on this far south of Denver. County Line was the end of the world. It was. Was it paved at that point? Or it was, was it still just been paved. Road? It just been paved. Yeah. And Arapahoe Road had just been paved and the Safeway had just opened on Arapahoe and Yosemite. Yeah. So I ended up um, finding the Mission Viejo office, applied for a job. And uh, they offered me a job as a construction superintendent trainee. Even though I had built a couple hundred homes, that was my qualifications at mm -hmm. the time. Uh, their office was in Inverness. It was in Inverness, recall. 6 Inverness Drive, I believe. Yeah. Uh, Eventually, they ended up where they are now. Well, they did. And, and uh, they also built a building over on Ridgeline Boulevard, the four-story. Um, and we had several hundred people in that building because we housed engineering, architecture, marketing, survey company called the Jack Robb Company. Robin Company, yeah. So we all shared that building. And um, I wasn't in the building. I was in a construction superintendent. So I was out on the trailer, which is out about where um, the, the, South, the uh, West Ridge Rec Center is now. There was a dirt road going out there. And uh, we had a compound of trailers. Mm -hmm. And the superintendents all worked out there. And there were quite a few of us. That's right. This is long before it became C-470 was built then. Yeah, C-470 was actually purchased from CDOT in 1984 um, and then built soon after that. So that really changed the complexion of the community. Was there an interchange at Lucent? That the, the interchange that, at Lucent was later. not there. That came later. Uh, in fact, it came about the same time as Shea purchased Highlands Ranch. Which was 1996. 96, yeah. 
Why did why did uh, their corporate parent Philip Morris decide to to sell Mission Viejo Company? Well, Mission Viejo Company was was a very minor bit of business for them, and Marvel cigarettes. They had Marvel cigarettes. Life. They had um, you know other things, and they were buying Kraft and General F and General Foods at the time. The um, originally Highlands Ranch became Highlands Ranch. A man named Phil Riley was pretty much the guy who discovered the property along with Teffer, Jim Teffer. Yeah. And at the Dick, time, Dick Brown. yeah, I didn't know him. Yeah. And uh, at the time, uh, Philip Morris was prohibited from running Marble Man ads on TV. So they happened to have an extra 25 million. Because of the extra tobacco? Yeah, the, the federal government. Tobacco? The federal government outlawed any TV ads. So they had a budget of 25 million, and it happened that they could buy Highlands Ranch for about that much. Yeah. So they purchased Highlands Ranch, um, and it all started. That's good. So yeah. who did you work for initially when you were a construction supervisor? There was a man named Bob Woodley, who was the vice president of construction. Um, mm -hmm. Him and Sil Egan, or Dave Egan, Sil's brother, were responsible for construction. And I worked for them for a few years, and then they were having a little, they had a little period where they wanted to build outside of Highlands Ranch, and they sent me up to Broomfield to build a few hundred homes. Mm -hmm. uh, we finished that, and then they asked me to oversee the purchasing department and the warranty department. So there were two people that ran those departments. And they originally wanted me to run warranty, and I said I really didn't want to do that because I didn't think they had enough authority. Which, which year was this? That was probably in 86, 85. Mm -hmm. So I ran both of those departments. In about 86, 87, they decided to get completely out of the home building business and sell the company to Shea, mm -hmm. to somebody. They didn't know Shea was the person. Mm -hmm. um, so we liquidated all the homes under construction, all the homes under contract, and we started laying people off. There, there were about 500 people in the organization at the time. They, got, they sold the Jack Robb company to a company called Nolte and Associates, um, and they laid off the rest of the staff, with the exception of about 30 of us. And we stayed around, and at that point we were selling residential lots to builders. So instead of like Richmond America, Richmond, Centex, U.S. Home, Oakwood, at one point we had 20 builders. Mm -hmm. So Jeff Kappas and I were responsible for selling lots. It was called a rolling option. So we would put them on the contract for say 100 lots, and every month, every quarter, we would give them 10, and then the next quarter 10. What we were told to do is not build too many lots ahead of ourselves. We were cash sensitive. That's cash flow. Yeah. And it was very unique to do it that way. No one in Denver had done it that way. But it was very successful for us. In one year, uh, Jeff and I sold a little over 3,000 lots to different builders. Where were these lots within the community? The, the first group of lots were really focused around Broadway, and then we grew out to the West Ridge area, and then we grew this way, um, which is why the, the uh, West Ridge Rec Center was the next one built. Um, Mission Viejo actually funded the first rec center. They funded the Sheriff's Department. At Northridge. Northridge Rec Center. Yeah. When you say they funded the Sheriff's Department, are you? They bought them trucks. Trucks. They bought them equipment. They didn't have equipment. Douglas County was not what it is now. In fact, when we would go visit the planning department down in Castle Rock, it was in a house. And you'd go up the back stairs to see Peter Italiano yeah. up there. I did an oral history with uh, Steve Zotos. Oh, yeah. And yes. he was telling me prior to the Douglas County Justice Center being built, same thing. Had an area over by the Douglas County Fairgrounds that would frequently flood yes. at that yeah. point. So there was a great need for that. Yeah, it, yeah, and the building is in a very close to the same location. Mm -hmm. um, 
So it was a, a different time and, and we developed and, and Jeff and I would, would sell the lots. We would help, there was a man named Terry Teague who did most of the design work. Jeff and I would walk every lot and apply a premium on it and would sell it to the builders. Um, Craig McCallum was the president at the time. Because he succeeded uh, Jim, Jim Teffer. Teffer. After yeah. Teffer retired, yes. retired in the late 80s. Yeah. And Craig was, uh, he had worked with the Irvine Company. He was also responsible for Mission Viejo, California. He was a brilliant man. Um, he was sometimes volatile, but he had a lot of, he had an incredible vision and an incredible care for the community. Uh, in fact, at one point, he m made me responsible for architectural review of all the commercial properties. So they had to go through us. That was prior to having the DRC under the HRCA. Mm -hmm. That actually came out of that idea, is to have a homeowner group reviewing plans as well. Explain a little bit more of the architectural control that you were involved in. What was involved? Well, every every house every and more so every commercial building is is there is a, a document called a special warranty deed that suggests certain rules that everyone has to follow that purchases that property they must build within a certain amount of time if they don't we can buy it back. Shea or mission at the time could buy it back it had requirements on how they were to conduct their business what business it was. If we sold a bowling alley to you, you had to build a bowling alley. And if you didn't, we would take it back. Um, that way we were able to sell things at different values to create a fabric of a community. For instance, when Harvey Marks wanted St. Andrew's Church, Mission Viejo could have gotten eight or ten bucks a foot for that land. We sold it at four because we needed because churches. Because it was a church. We needed churches. Yeah. We were building the, a community and the fabric of a community. Mm -hmm. When we sold Cherry Hills Community Church, we didn't sell it at market price. We sold it less. So our theory was to build things that were successful, to allow things to be successful. And many folks didn't agree with that. For instance, if we had a gas station on one corner, we did not build a gas, allow a gas station on the other corner. And we prohibit uses. If you buy it for the Dumb Friends League and you sell it for a gas station, which happened over on Santa Fe, it's a different value. So we would get some of that value back. So it was, when, when it was said that we were a master plan, we thought about everything. Every building, we reviewed the architecture very closely. Early on in the community, we heard lots of things about the development plan mm -hmm. and that that was a work in process that evolved over time. How long did that go on? Or was it given a different name? Because you're talking about things that are very similar to that process. Oddly, the development plan was created in 1979. Steve Ormiston was a big part of that and Terry yep. T. It didn't really change that much. The, the planning areas pretty much stayed in the general location. The boundaries made. You know, the development plan had different areas for different zoning densities. Yes. And where the commercial would go, where the retail would go, yeah. where the schools would go. Yeah, and I would say it stayed very, very close. Um, some of the designations changed. Some of the names changed. Some of the names that were called in the development guide are no longer there and they just don't exist and there's new things. We didn't deal with cell towers. So do you have an example of that? Um, of a name change? Uh, well, high density residential, for instance, had a cap of 20 units per acre. It's not unusual to see 25 to the acre. So density changes. Um, I can't think of any name changes right now. Um, but there's, you know, there's different technologies and, and things have changed. Oddly enough, the original development plan 
was approved for 36,400 units. Right now, we're 240 units shy of that. And there's 10 acres left and that, that have not been developed. That's owned by Shea Properties. Did that include the, uh, the backcountry development? Yes. And we will, Shea is now designing a product with 240 units. So where would that be? It, it would be uh, north of the water treatment plant, mm -hmm. uh, north of Plaza Drive. Oddly, we're hitting that number exactly, which is unbelievable. And when we sold lots, when we developed everything we did, we were very conscious that we went through all the land, but didn't overdo it and didn't underdo it because those dwelling units were important. Otherwise, a homeowner would have higher taxes, higher tap fees. So it was important that we keep things like our water fees as low as possible and tap fees as low as possible so that people could afford homes. That simple. Well, that was the big draw in the early days. <clears throat> to get people to come out in the middle of nowhere was the price of homes. And that was part of why Mission Viejo built homes at the beginning. Even though uh, the interest rates were higher? Interest rates were higher and they weren't making much money. If they were making any on a house, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to create a community and to create a special community. And some of the things that, that we did we're a little bit crazy. Yeah. We would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars sweeping streets. We would have guys walking the streets picking up, at the time, cigarette butts. Because Craig believed the community needed to look beautiful. And many times we toured people around from other states, other developments, like the Woodlands in Houston, Summerlin in Las Vegas, and they would say, gosh, I don't know what it is, but this place looks great. So our goal and our job was to make sure people didn't see everything, but they felt it. They felt the community was special. We had a guy named Dwayne Blossom who designed all our street landscaping. And there's a, there was a rhythm to it. There was a number of trees per acre. And there was a program. Everything was planned. Nothing was by half. It was all by whole. I'd heard the story that <clears throat> originally when the development plan was put together and they talked about the major arterial roads is that though the community could have gone cheap and only put in what they needed at that point before the remaining lots were sold around the area, that they decided to build uh, at full capacity even though that would be, wouldn't be needed for many years in the future. That's right and concrete streets, yeah, which lasted longer. And the theory would be that if you build it at full capacity now, it would be more, it would be uh, more economic, economic over the long term. Yeah, and rather and than coming in later and having to add in the construction, well, and would happen later on. And and you're you're showing what you're going to be, and there'd be no no secrets. Every single house we sell we did what's called a contiguous area report. And that report told those people that were buying that house exactly what would be built around them. And if it was a gas station, it said it could be loud, it could be obnoxious, it could smell, and you knew that when you moved in. Now many people missed that, I think, although they signed it, but that was one thing that we heard several times was no one told me there'd be a shopping center there. That wasn't 100% accurate. In fact, it was in the deed, which is transferred with the property. Mm -hmm. But that's just part of the business. Good. You've been involved in helping a number of corporations come out to Highlands Ranch. Mm -hmm. Initially, when the community got started, there was very few mm -hmm. at this point. Tell me how that all happened. Well, it's funny. When we, um, when we started the residential, we used to rent a bus every other week, and I'd call a brokerage firm and say, we'll bring, it a, we'll bring you on a bus ride to Highlands Ranch and tell you all the secrets, and we'll buy you lunch. And we would go and get Kentwood Moore or whoever it was, and we'd drive them around on a bus, sometimes on dirt roads, and show them what was happening. 
as we got bigger and commercial started, we did the same thing with commercial brokers. In fact, we hauled them down here. We had barbecues down in Northridge. We had softball games. And we just got them out to see it. And then we treated the brokers right, which is incredibly important that they are our lifeblood. These were residential brokerages Both. or commercial? Commercial and residential. And the commercial brokers started to know about Highlands Ranch. Now, we seeded it because we built a lot of the stuff ourselves, particularly on Ridgeline Boulevard, the convenience center. We sold the Village Inn restaurant site for $14,000. It's the best site in Highlands Ranch. We sold another site next to it to Jackson's Hole Restaurants, which did not build, and we ended up buying it back for 200000 We bought it back for four hundred, and we sold it again for a million four. Is there now? Now there is, um, uh, I can't remember who's there. It was CB and Potts, right. and then it got torn down. Oh, it's okay. Lazy Dog um, okay. is there. So we, we priced things to create the community at the beginning. We weren't interested in making, everyone's interested in making money. We knew the money would come later. What we had to do was create a tax base. We had to support the district. Uh, all of us, at, many of us at Mission Viejo understood the districts. In fact, many, Steve Ormiston, Jeff Kappas, Terry Krzyznik, and I were on the district boards when they started. We were on District 1. When we had enough homeowners, we went to District 2, had enough homeowners. We phased ourselves out of that job and turned it over to citizens. One of the things we needed to make sure was the citizens understood what the vision was. And they've done a very good job. Centennial Water was a different matter because it was so complicated. And recently, we turned that over within the last year, all to homeowners. And, but the but the water for Highlands Ranch is very, very secure. We were also part of, and I was on the board for the Chatfield Reservation, Chatfield Reservoir uh, project where we raised the water level 14 feet to create more capacity. Right. So we've been part of all those things. It's been intentional. Everything here is intentional. There's no doubt about it. And most of these times we've talked about you were working with Mission Viejo Company. Hmm. Things changed dramatically around 1996. Explain what happened and your role and what happened afterwards. You know, it was a, it was a very interesting time because we had a, a full staff working full time and um, things changed essentially over the period of a, a couple of years where we, we extracted, mission extracted themselves out of the home building business and we started selling residential lots and it was clear that Mission Viejo company owned by Philip Morris didn't want to be in the home building business anymore. And then when they were purchasing Kraft Food, they decided they want out of the development business. So they hired a firm out of New York to sell the company. And um, we had a team of folks that would talk to these companies and uh, in the end, there were six looking at Highlands Ranch in Mission Viejo, California. Um, was there Arizona properties too? No. The Arizona property weren't in it at all. That was just Mission Viejo, California, Aliso. Aliso and Mission. And Aliso both sides, was... Both sides of the highway there. Yes. And Mission Viejo was pretty much done. It was Aliso, Viejo, and Highlands Ranch. The, uh, the buyers came in and... Fortunately, the, um, one of the things that was a consistent theme at Mission Viejo was to do the right thing. Um, and, and I like to believe that the folks at Mission Viejo that got involved in the water district as well as the metro district, we believe the same thing. It was always a little controversial that you had developers, particularly on Centennial. But there would be times when we would vote for things that were at odds with what the developer wanted, but it was the right thing for Centennial. And I think that that has proven itself to be a valuable philosophy. 
And, and Mission Viejo always had that. Craig McCallum pressed us on that. Joe Blake pressed us on that. They were the leaders. The, when the sale occurred, they didn't want to see someone come up and fragment the community. They want someone who would finish it as good as they started it. How much was left of the community that uh, about been developed? Probably about 50%. It was quite a bit. Again, um, this is 1996? Yeah, 96. Uh -huh. yeah. And we were, again, we were selling a couple thousand homes, a couple thousand lots a year. At, at one point in the late 80s, 25% of the homes purchased in Metro Denver were purchased in Highlands Ranch. That's a huge number. It's a huge number, and part of that was the security of Highlands Ranch and the fact that it was finishing strong, although people never knew right where the finish line was. But the point was, when they sold it, they kept that philosophy. Shea Properties, Shea, J.F. Shea Company purchased Highlands Ranch from Mission Viejo, both in Mission Viejo and in Denver. They were not the highest bidder, but they were the most trustworthy bidder. And from the day that we met the Shays, John, Edmund, and Peter are the family that, ru that ran the Shays at that point. And Bert was involved too? Bert was involved. He was the president of the division here, and it was a small division. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, we were selling lots to Bert. But the Shays came out and interviewed what was left of us, about 20 people, and they kept a few of us. And we just started the company over as Shea Homes. So at, the point, at that point, Shea Homes was also responsible for Shea Properties. I, got trans I had gotten transferred into the Properties Division. So homes was primarily residential? Homes point. was all residential. Yeah. And Properties was what, everything Commercial. else? Commercial. Everything else? Shopping centers, mm -hmm. Shea Center 1 and 2 mm -hmm. office buildings, and selling commercial land that supported that. The Shays did not want to sell all the land to other developers. But if we had a user come in that would add value to the community, like Lucent at the time, we negotiated the deal with Lucent. And the beauty of it was Lucent came out and they said, there's not even a road going in there. We said, no, but there will be an interchange. Plaza Drive will be built and we'll have it built by the time you open. So we worked with our friends like Forrest Dykstra, Terry Nolan. All who were with Metro District. Metro District, because those were facilities they wanted. It was a lot of controversy building Lucent Boulevard. We were sued by John Fielder and his group. Why? Because they owned land on the north side of McCullen Reservoir. They didn't want to see the interchange. Now, they were a little bit underfunded. In fact, when they were looking for discovery, they wanted to use our copy machine because they didn't want to spend the money on copies. <laughs> but they, nevertheless, they lost. We got the interchange built, we got Plaza built, we got Lucent done. The beauty of that was it was a collaborative effort between the Metro District and Shea. And then Visa came around. Visa was looking at Meridian Office Park, which oddly I oversee now under, because Shea purchased that in the tech center. And Meridian is east. It's, it's east of us, right on I-25. So we, we developed, we started developing commercial property, and we wanted to keep it. So we had Ridgeline Office Park buildings. We had Shea Center. We built some other buildings outside of Highlands Ranch. Cheddar Latcham, who's now the president of Shea Homes, became the vice president of Shea Properties. And I worked for him until he got promoted, then I took over Shea Properties. So, and then Town Center, we actually started during the Mission Viejo days. And how it started was... I kept thinking that Town Center was 2000. It was, but uh, it started a long time before 1994 that. 1994 or whatever. No, it started, what happened was the, the county had a vision for what it was going to be. And they thought it'd be the center of Highlands Ranch. And... We had a, a committee at one point of 100 people that was the sheriff's department because they wanted a piece, 
the library. Safeway was already built. The they were, library. They were one of the first. They were the first. And, and then we, we developed, um, we sold land to Hanover for apartments to the south of that. Uh, Jeff and I did that transaction. And that was it. And then the rest, the 90 acres, was left. The county had a vision for what it was going to be. And that vision was a little more robust than we thought it could be. So what we did is um, we traveled, I, me and a few other guys, land planners, traveled around the country looking at town centers. And what we really realized is they work in short bits. Two blocks is about it. Now there's stories about we want it to look like South Glen or areas like that, but if you really evaluate it, two blocks is about all the retail you're going to get. And you need an anchor. And we couldn't get an anchor because we had Safeway. So we went after Home Depot, which wasn't the most popular move between the citizens. And it wasn't with Home Depot either because they want, they want to be on the corner. We said to Home Depot, you can be in Highlands Ranch or it's going to be Lowe's, but you're going to be in the middle and we're going to surround you with retail. None of the other uh, residential townhouses or apartments have been built. No, that was it. That was the beginning. So who were the citizens that complained? Oh, there were hundreds. Where did they live if they didn't live close to there? They, part of our business is allaying fears. And people have fears about certain developments. And they, they hear the bad things or they vision the bad things. There's going to be too much traffic. That's a very common one. Too much noise. Big trucks rolling in at all hours. Whether it's true or not is sometimes up for discussion, but the fact is they're scared. So one of our jobs and technique is to help people understand exactly how things are going to work and allay their fears. And it happens more so when you're building things like loosened apartments. That was, they didn't want apartments there. And I had coffee with several residents and said, what are your concerns? They tell you their concerns. And then a good developer can allay those concerns. We gave a big open space between the apartments and their homes or in the, the case of Home Depot. We put it somewhat in a hole with a retaining wall around the back of it. Allays the noise. So we work with them. And with, that, with the town center group, it took about five years of working with them because they had a different vision than what we could produce. And our job was to make it fit the vision, but also be economically feasible. Now, the buildings... We're, we, want, uh, we wanted them all brick, and I'm a little guilty of that because I come from Boston and the East Coast, and everything's brick there. If it wasn't, if it wasn't brick, it burned at it's one point. At one point. Days. So you'll notice every building has predominantly brick there. It didn't make a whole bunch of money for the shades, but what it did is it stood. It's a great picture. The tower... Mm -hmm. is identical to a tower in Dorchester, Massachusetts, where I played hockey. That tower is on Dorchester Street. We got the name of the streets. You might notice that Opie Drive mm -hmm. is in front of Home Depot because people said, we don't want a big Home Depot. We want an Ace Hardware. We want this to be Mayberry. Play on words, Opie Drive. Okay. Catherine Hepburn died one day. Kath Hepburn Drive. We were in control of that. They're all private streets. And the little square in the middle, that's from a square exactly in Newport, Rhode Island. I was going to guess New England. It's all New England. Yeah. Every building has a name. Mm -hmm. Some of them are on the front of the building, the Frederick building. Who's Frederick? Who knows? Just made it up. It's funny. That's one of the things that we try to do in our retail, is people will ask, why do we have gorillas in town center? Because it was funny. Because we happened at, I saw them in a catalog and thought, that would be great to put some of those up. And we could put signs up that say gorilla crossing. Wouldn't that be funny? It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it's fun. 
And if we can instill fun a little bit in retail, that's people, great. People will come. People will smile. Yeah. And that's the best and you get. And return. And they'll remember. So that was that's something that is important for people to remember about Highlands Ranch is the care that went into it, the thoughtfulness, the granularity to all of it. It's looking at every detail. For a while we had newspaper stands, and the reason we had those is because the Denver Post and Rocky Mountain News came out and started chaining boxes to all the light poles. It looked terrible. So we created concrete pads for them to sit on nicely, and we enforced that. So there was an enforcement. We had people that would drive around and write violation letters if people's light bulbs were out on their signs. It's not really a violation. It's a recommendation to fix it. We didn't find people, but we wanted things to look good. And we spent a lot of money doing that. So it was a good thing. Town center north of Highlands Ranch Parkway. Yes. That was developed after the south side? Yes. And the Home Depot and all that? Yes. How did that come about? Well, it came about because of the one, the, the uh, it became apparent that our absorption of office space was about 30,000 square feet per year. Denver Tech Center, much higher than that. In fact, the Tech Center has about 35 million square feet of office space. There's about 30 million downtown. So the Tech Center was growing faster than downtown. Even though the buildings aren't tall, there's more of them. Tech Center is 805 acres. Meridian is 504 acres. It was clear they were going down the I-25 corridor. And we were not going to get a bunch of offices. Our waterfront property, such as Lucent on the edge, Visa selected it because there was open space behind it and they were concerned about vehicular assaults, particularly bombs, because it happened right after the Oklahoma bombing. We hired a bomb consultant. Visa, in this case, is the credit card company? Yes. Yeah. And there's three buildings there. One's an office building. Yeah. Two of them are data processing centers. Every debit card in America goes through one of those. So they're very concerned about safety. The open space provided safety and the buildings were built in a manner which they'll withstand a 400-pound explosive device from 50 feet. Most consumers <clears throat> in the community would never know that. And, and for every minute it's down, it costs Visa a million bucks. So those things were important. But we weren't getting any more office. So we went to the county and said, we need to create something different. We need a mixed-use environment. And my and at the time, Shea then owned the property. Peter Colshaw, who was a visionary behind Meridian and the Tech Center and I, went out there on a Sunday and we said, we need a big idea. We need something really cool. And we came up with the idea, basically on a napkin, of a small park in the middle and roads around it, possibly a hospital. We had no idea we could get a hospital. I was working with Children's Hospital, and I was sending Children's Hospital a car seat every week to remind them that Highlands Ranch had a lot of babies. Highlands Ranch Children's Hospital hadn't been built at that point? No. No. And so we just kept pushing these things. Mm -hmm. And we finally got Target done, and then we built the other retail around it pretty much speculative. But we had a pretty good idea on who we could get. And um, so we built that, and then we built Central Park. That came much later. Came much later. And the apartments near it, the Chrome Apartments, which are some of the best leasing apartments in Highlands Ranch. Um, <clears throat> That's pretty much built out now. Yeah, it, it is 100% built out. Yeah. We sold um, a couple hundred lots to Shea Homes because we work separately. Shea Homes and Shea Properties operate separately. And we worked together, but separately. And they built their product. We built the apartments. We built the retail. And we were able to work a deal with UC Health. So it all that came, came together. even later. Much later, yeah. right at the end. In fact, they're adding on right now. You're um, on the board? Of I am UC on the board. Health. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I've been involved in it 
since the beginning. Um, it's a fascinating environment, and um, again, quality control is paramount to what they do, obviously. How do you find time to be on all of these boards? I've got a very understanding wife. I get up early, and I really, really enjoy it. And I enjoy the boards I'm on. Uh, I'm involved in a nonprofit that feeds kids that is I'm very passionate about. Which one is that? It's called Fruit for Thought. And tell, we, tell us more about it. We, um, we started 12 years ago, and we started as a, a one-day backpacking program. Met a principal who said, backpacks are fine, but they only feed my kids once a week, mm. once a year, and my kids are hungry every week. Why don't you deliver food every week? So we said, okay. And we started packing bags to feed the kids that are in Title I school in Denver, one particular school. Where do you find your sources for that? We beg for money. And we buy food from Food Bank of the Rockies. Yeah. And we started with one school. We deliver food every Friday. The kids can pick it up, put it in their backpack, and go home. Mm -hmm. And we feed every kid in the school, because we know 92% of the kids are on lunch assist. And we started going after other schools. And we pack outside underneath the Colfax Viaduct downtown. And we pack about 5,000 bags every Friday morning by 8 o'clock. It's a great success story. It's, we're now serving 82 schools. Our budget has increased to $1.5 million a year, and we have no overhead. It's 100% volunteers. We beg for money. We buy, the only thing we buy is food, okay. and everything else is given to us. So it's great. And that's, that gives you more energy for more time. So what's, what's in the future for Highlands Ranch, specifically on the, the property side? We know that the community on the residential side is pretty much built out. It is built out, as is the properties. We're down to the last 10 acres. That's, that's known for anything other than residential. Highlands Ranch essentially is done. There's that 240 <clears throat> units or so left, and we'll build them. and. You know, and you'll be building other places. Uh, Shea Properties and Shea Homes both build in other areas. We purchased land. I had a chance to go over east of uh, Lone Tree to uh, look at some of the homes that are being planned at Lyric. Yeah. At this point. Shea Homes does great work. Yeah. And I'm sure you've got other properties down near Castle Pines and other places. That they, they do. <clears throat> um, Shea Properties, we have several hundred acres to mess around with. We, we've built some stuff downtown. We built a 29-story apartment building and an office building, and um, we'll find stuff to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's so, great. We'll keep the legacy going. So you're still, you're still working full-time? I work full-time. Enjoy every minute of it. Yeah, that's good. It's a great uh, business. <clears throat> I did a, an oral history with uh, Terry Nolan ah. at one point. Terry yeah. at the time was probably in his early 70s. Yeah. And Terry was with the, the Metro District yeah. uh, at that point, and I asked him and said, Terry, any, any thoughts on your future retirement coming up, whatever? And he kind of answered like you did and said, no, he loves his job, things are great, and didn't anticipate that, and within a year, he decided to retire. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it happens. When it's right, it's right. It happens. It's, and that was Terry's second changed. job. He was a fighter pilot first. Yes, he was, uh, out uh, in California. Yeah, when we uh, on the Bay Area, no. when we hired him, Joe Blake and Jeff Kappas and I were on the hiring committee, and yeah. Terry Christensen, and uh, he's a very impressive person. And people said, "Well, he's never run a district." I said, "No, true. but that's true." But, but you know what? Fresh eyes. He's got the skill set. Yeah, um, I see him occasionally. He is. Uh, he's a very aggressive uh, pickleball player. Yes, he is. <laughs> yes, he is. And golfer too. Yeah. Um, you know, I I think. And one of the things that's been true for both Shea organizations, Shea Homes and Shea Properties, we hire people that are athletes. Athletes meaning they can do anything in the business, and we can train them. And that's half the fun. That's interesting. I had never heard that philosophy from, yeah. from Shea. The, the guy who's working with me has never leased anything before in his life. He's a finance guy, but it was clear he could, he could do it. I did an oral history with Jeff Kappas. 
Yeah. And Jeff talked about his early days back in 78 yeah. when Michigan hired him in right out of college, whatever. And yeah. He, he called himself just a pup. Yeah, he was. He didn't know anything. No. But he learned, and he learned to do a lot of things over the years. And just had lunch still, with him. He's still with, uh, he's still with Shea. No, he retired. He did retire. Yeah, a couple, when uh, was that? A couple months ago. Okay, so yeah. new information. So. Yep. Yeah, what, he's, uh, he only lasted in retirement about a month, then he found another gig he's doing. <laughs> Less okay. stress. All right. So what's in the future for you? Um. I don't know. Woodworking. I build furniture, mm -hmm. and I fly fish. Yeah. I got four grandkids, and that my wife keep, and I. That should, are they local? Yeah, they that are. Should keep you. That could keep you occupied. Yeah, my wife and I hike a lot and snowshoe a lot, so That's we good. stay busy. You know, my news had an article about lots of muddy trails at this point in time. So. Yeah, I, I walked the bluffs this morning. It was very muddy. Yeah, about. We don't get these big snows too no, much. We're blessed. Water pack is 108% right now. So. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's uh, really good. I was uh, in the house that I'm still in in 2003 when they had a four foot March storm. Oh, yeah. That collapsed the deck and the trellis overhead and the whole thing. So I remember that, four feet. I hope Shay didn't build the house. No, no, it was a Richmond American. <laughs> this was a homeowner's built deck, by the way. Oh, is there? It was not engineered properly. <laughs> and, then I, and then we had a friend that uh, replaced the part that wasn't covered by a roof. And uh, it's, you could jump up and down on it, and it doesn't move. Good. <laughs> and that's been fine. Uh, yeah, many, many years since then. Well, you get the last word. Anything well, you'd like to say about your experiences? I think I think one thing that I can say is that I've been blessed with leaders and mentors and hope that I can mentor younger kids. And and I said it at John Hendricks retirement party, we always want to do the right thing. And as a developer John is with the water. John John Hendricks ran water. ran Centennial for several years. Yeah. John was brilliant. Dr. Hendricks. He's still in Highlands Ranch. And our, our job, our mission, no pun intended, is to do the right thing. And we're lucky now because we have the Shays that allow that. They don't talk about profits. They talk about doing the right things, keeping people safe, giving them what they expect. And then profit flows from that if you do the right thing. If you do the right thing, it always works. Yeah. It always works. Well, on behalf of the Historical Society, I want to thank you for all your insights into your illustrious career and making the community what it is today. You're welcome. And what will be in the future. Yeah, it will be. I'm so, sure of it. I mean, so, look at this place. Yeah. Pretty special. So again, thank you, Jim. Thank you.